we're going to see over the next few days several operations that we um, apply to functions that create a new function. So particularly operations that involve taking the derivative. And the first one I want to discuss is called the gradient. So if you have a function that's scalar valued, in other words the output is a scalar, then you can find the gradient which makes a vector field. What you do is you just for the three components of this, if there are three inputs to the function then the three components are the derivative with respect to x, the derivative with respect to y, and the derivative with respect to z. If your function only depends on two variables then you can just make a 2D vector field. You take the derivative with respect to the first variable and the derivative with respect to the second variable. Those make this new function which we call the gradient of f. Let's just do a quick example. So if we um, have this function, it depends on three variables. So the gradient is going to be a vector field. So it's going to be a function from R3 to R3. And these are the components, the, the gradient of F. And I use a bold letter for the name because it's a vector valued function. Or sometimes you'll see people write maybe a vector this way for gradient. So the first component is going to be the partial derivative with respect to x. So we look at this function. The derivative of this with respect to x is 2xy, and the derivative of this with respect to x is cosine z. So there's my first component. The second component is the derivative with respect to y, and this is the only thing that depends on y, and its derivative with respect to y is x squared. And finally we take the derivative with respect to z. That doesn't depend on z, but this does. The derivative of cosine is minus sine, so we get minus x sine z. So we took our scalar valued function, right? This is a function that had three inputs and one output, and we made a function that has three inputs and three outputs. And we'll just see that this gradient actually gives us some, some interesting information about the original function, and yet it's a function itself. <coughs> the next operation that we'll um, compute is called the divergence. Now, the divergence takes a vector field, so you have a function that has three inputs here and three outputs, and I've just labeled those outputs m, n, and p. That's pretty common, and we make, we make now a scalar-valued function, and that scalar-valued function, the output is just the partial of the first component with respect to x plus the partial of the second component with respect to y plus the partial of the third component with respect to z. Since we're adding those three numbers up, we just get a single number, the scalar. Of course, we could also have this divergence um, if there was only two inputs and two outputs. So if this was just a vector field in R2, then we could create the divergence, but it would only consist of m sub x plus n sub y because there is no partial with respect to z to add in there. Let's just do a quick example. Here's a vector field, right, in from R3 to R3. So we can compute the divergence of f. This will now be a scalar valued function. We'll take the partial of the first component with respect to x, which is just 1, plus the partial of the second component with respect to y, which is also 1, plus the partial of the third component with respect to z, that's xy. So we get this scalar valued function, xy plus 2. So this gives us information about our original, inf our original function f. For now, we just want to be able to compute it so that if somebody happens to mention the divergence of f, we know that we're just talking about the sum of the partials of the components with respect to um, other input variables. So this created, took a vector field and created a scalar valued function. Um, so we could also take a vector field and create a new vector field by combining the derivatives in this particular pattern. If we use this particular pattern, this function is called the curl, and we'll find out that this particular pattern also tells us something a little bit about the vector field, so we'll use that later. For now, we just want to know what someone means when they talk about the curl of a vector field. So we know what it's going to mean to create a vector field like this. Let's just work a quick example. If you, if you look at the curl here, um, we're going to make a new vector field. So I'll write it in bold, or sometimes people put an arrow over the top to indicate that it's a vector field. So the curl f, let's see, we take the derivative of the last component with respect to y minus the derivative of the second component with respect to z. So the derivative of the last component with respect to y is xz in this case, minus the derivative of the second component with respect to z is 0. So notice that in the curl, um, the first component has nothing to do with the first variable or the first component. There's no m in here and there's no x, so it only has to do with the remaining two components and the last two variables. But the middle term here has nothing to do with the middle component n or with the middle variable y. So, All right, let's see. So this one says the second component should be the partial of the first component with respect to z, which in this case the partial with respect to z is 0. 
minus the partial of the last component with respect to x. The derivative of this with respect to x is yz. And then the third component should be the partial of the second component with respect to the first variable. So the derivative of this with respect to x is 1 minus the derivative of the first component with respect to y, which is minus 1. So all together we get a new vector field and the components are xz minus yz and 2 in this case. Now this curl, if we had um, a vector field that was just a, a two-dimensional vector field, so two inputs and two outputs, then so if it looks something like this, well we could apply this rule if we just took our vector field and embedded it in in three dimensions. So we'll just add a third component, but that third component really doesn't do anything. Okay, so now we could calculate the curl of that vector field. So this this particular operation called the curl applied to that vector field creates this new vector field. And um, if we look at it, the third component is zero, right? So that's zero. And our original vector field if it really was a vector field, it would only have two inputs, x and y, and so there would be no z, so we'd get 0 minus 0, which would be 0 for the first component. And let's see, m sub z, well, our original function didn't depend on z, so that's going to be 0. And p, p sub x, we, put, we just inserted a 0 in order to embed our two-dimensional vector field in three dimensions, so we're going to have 0 there. And um, Let's see, this last one, then we have n sub x minus m sub y. So we would just get, we do have an n, and it does, it could depend on x, and we do have a m, and it could depend on y, so we get this new vector field. Okay, so we get this new vector field, and it um, only has a z component, whereas the original only had x and y components, right? So we get this new vector field like that. A lot of times we, we are in, only interested in, and the only interesting part of the curl of a two-dimensional vector field is just that last component. So we'll just take curl f and we'll dot it with the unit vector in the k direction. In other words, we're going to take our curl here and we're going to dot it with this vector that is 0, 0, 1. And that will just pick out the only non-zero part here, which is n sub x minus m sub y. So the curl really applies to three-dimensional vector fields, but you can you could apply it to a two-dimensional vector field by embedding your two-dimensional vector field in three-dimensional space and then taking taking the curl.